Okay, we'll start with this, our continued coverage of this past weekend's action in the women's featherweight division. Denmark, reigning WBC silver champion Sarah Mafood effectively defended her title against former champion Marcela Tigresa Acuña. It's important to note that there was no U.S. broadcaster for the fight. So if you were here stateside and you were interested in watching it, well, you would have been hard-pressed to find a signal, hard-pressed to find a link. Though if you were familiar with both fighters and the circumstances of the match, Sarah would have seemed the obvious choice. If you are familiar with the fighters and familiar with the circumstances, that Sarah is a lot, and I mean a lot younger, than Marcela Acuña, over a decade younger than Marcela. I think Marcela is something like 46 years old and she's still punching and that's admirable. But if you step her up, she's gonna lose. She's still got enough left in the tank to beat certain kinds of fighters, journey women. But if you step her up, she's gonna lose. She lost this past weekend what's said to be a wide points loss to Sarah Mafood, the defending WBC silver champion, that WBC silver title. It can be used as a segue to get her an Amanda Serrano rematch, an Amanda Serrano fight, though I don't think that's what she's really after. Sarah's already been there and done that with Amanda, and she lost a lopsided decision. I don't get the sense that's why she's hanging on to that WBC silver title. She ain't after no rematch. She's holding her position. If she's doing anything, she's holding her position, perhaps with the hopes that once Amanda's done in the sport of boxing, and she might be very soon, she just inked a deal with the people at the PFL. She means to reignite her mixed martial arts career, and if she does and she vacates those titles, what I think Sarah is doing is positioning herself to catch one, the WBC title. Not without one or two obstacles. While Sarah Mafood is in possession of a WBC title, a secondary version of the title, she's not the only one. Australia's own Sky Nicholson is the WBC interim champion. And if anybody's the mandatory for Amanda, it would be Sky before it's Sarah. Do I think Sky's about to fight Amanda? No. Even though she's been calling her out. I think Sky is about to fight Sarah. I think at the World Boxing Council's annual convention a little later on this year, what we might see is a fight ordered between the WBC silver champion, Sarah Mafood, and the WBC interim champion, Sky. Nicholson. That's what I think. And that has all the makings of an interesting fight. A good step-up fight for Sky. Solid fight for Sarah. More sensible and sensical fight for both when you think about it. I don't think it makes a lot of sense for the World Boxing Council to order a fight between Amanda Serrano and Sky Nicholson straight away. I think she should have to work a little harder for it. Yeah. Moreover, I think she needs to to continue to develop and round out as a professional boxer, a professional because this ain't the Emmys. Sarah's a former champion. Similarities between her and Sky Nicholson, they both like to fight on the balls of their feet. They're both mobile fighters, not the biggest punchers. Like to keep it long and loose and on on the move. I will say that Sarah Mafood has the experience that Sky Nicholson doesn't have. She has actually been in the ring with Amanda Serrano. I don't think Sarah will give Sky the same respect she gave Amanda because Sky doesn't have the same power as Amanda. She'll take more chances. If they fight, if the World Boxing Council orders it and they share the ring with each other, I think Sarah will show a bit more spice with Sky than she showed with Amanda. With Amanda, she stayed on her bike because she she knew if she stopped moving and Amanda kept punching, Amanda would have took her out. She stayed on a bike the whole fight. And like Charlo did with Canelo, just trying to weather the storm, trying to hang on, trying to survive. That's how Sarah fought Amanda, but she wouldn't fight Sky that way because Sky ain't got Amanda's power. Sky ain't got Amanda's work rate. This could be competitive. Comparatively, Sarah Mafood has been in there with better fighters than Sky has been in there with, and comparatively, Sarah has beat better fighters than Sky has been in there with. Argentina's Karen Carabajal, Germany's own Nina Menke. The fight that she just had with Marcela Acuña this weekend, who by and large is a better and more experienced, more decorated fighter than anybody that Sky has fought so far. Nicholson versus Mafood. Makes a lot of sense to me. I think they'll order it. Yeah. Sarah's actually got a decent looking right hand when she lets it go, and Sky, Sky's working on that straight left. It's coming along. Nicholson versus Mafood. I think it happens. Yeah. For now, congratulations to Sarah Mafood for racking up another W and hanging on to the WBC silver title. Men's junior middleweight news. Paulie Malinaji says, if Jermel Charlo fights Tim Zhu, I think Zhu knocks him out. Well, how's that work? Canelo Alvarez couldn't knock him out at 168. How would Tim knock him out at 154? I'll tell you how. 
having not made 154 in such a long time, if he tries to make it for a Tim Zoo fight, that might leave him depleted. That's how. The two rivals are expected by some observers to collide in 2024, and while Charlo will likely pursue a lucrative showdown against Terence Crawford, Malinaji would like to see him earn that fight by facing Tim Zhu. And if the fight were to happen at this point in time, Malinaji would back Zhu to come away with a knockout victory. Instead of getting Crawford, he, Charlo, should now have to fight Tim Zhu after that performance, Malinaji said, according to Fox Sports. Charlo's stock is down. At a time when he was under orders to face Tim Zhu as his mandatory challenger by way of the WBO. He made a decision that I think most fighters, most champions would have made. He decided to go with the Canelo fight instead of the Tim Zhu fight. And I don't begrudge him for that. Anybody would have made that same choice. So when the sales pitch is this is you daring to be great, daring to be great, yet Charlo didn't dare to do anything except collect a check. It's insulting. Malinaji continued, and if he beats Tim Zhu, then maybe he can get Crawford. But I don't think Jamel is hungry, and getting this 20 million racks is going to make him less hungry. I think if he fights Tim Zhu, Tim Zhu knocks him out. Jamel at his best was world class, but this is not a hungry fighter. This is not a guy who wants to fight. This is a guy who wants to steal the bank and is looking for a free check. By product of inactivity? And a massive payday falling in his lap. The stars just kind of aligned for Jermel to get that Canelo fight. And he got it and he got paid. That's great. But is he hungry? How hungry is he really? He didn't fight like a hungry fighter with Canelo, and after getting that big fat fucking purse, I don't think he's gonna be that hungry after that. Is he gonna fight Tim Zhu? Before it even becomes about Tim and Jermel, Tim's gotta get past Brian Mendoza. Brian, who already arrived in Australia a couple of days ago, and is expecting a firefight with Tim Zhu. At this point in the juncture, Tim can't be asleep at the wheel. He cannot afford to look past Brian Mendoza. Put away the Charlo stuff and the Crawford stuff. Put all that stuff away, because this is who you're fighting. The WBO's decision has provided Brian Mendoza with the opportunity to challenge for a world title. We had a peaceful flight over here. We made sure we didn't want to come out here just a few days before because it is a big time difference from America. We're ready to go, Mendoza told Fox Sports. I never look past my opponents. How can I? I'm the underdog in this fight. He's a tough fighter, a warrior. I'm just going in there and if anything, I'm looking more at what I bring to the table rather than what he's lacking. He arrived in Australia a few days ago because the time difference between Australia and America is something like, I don't know, 15 hours? You don't want to wait too late to get there. You have to acclimatize your body to that time zone. That was smart of Brian and his team, allowing him that time to adapt. I think I bring something to the table he hasn't seen before. They've all brought different things to the table, my previous opponents. And I think Tim is going to be a different type of tough. With Tim, it's going to be a lot of pressure and big shots because we both go for the knockout. I've been using that word underdog and I'm thriving in this role because the victories are much sweeter when you pull it off. When you go into the ring against the guy you are expected to beat, it's not the same, but upsetting the odds, upsetting the world and even shocking the world. It's so much sweeter. I'm enjoying this role and I plan to be an underdog for a long time because even after this I plan on taking on tougher and tougher fights. He is the underdog going into this thing but he's racked up some solid victories. A victory over former unified champion Jason Rosario. Big upset win over then unbeaten Sebastian Fundoria. I want to say that there are caveats, there are handicaps, that Jason is a strong puncher, but he doesn't take a good punch. Sebastian Fundora, it was only a matter of time before he got caught, yeah. before he got stopped. I said it many times. Big guy like that constantly giving up his height to trade hooks on the inside. It's only a matter of time before somebody clocks you clean. Cleans your clock. And Brian Mendoza, he cleaned his clock. It was impressive. It was. But that's not what he's going to be facing in Tim Zhu. He's more fundamentally sound. Than Sebastian Fundora. The pressure he applies, it is a lot more educated. He does a lot of punch picking as opposed to what you see from Sebastian. They're both pressure guys. They're both mid range to inside pressure guys, Tim Zhu and Sebastian Fundora. But Sebastian, he's just winging hooks, winging shots, and, and hoping for the best while sacrificing his height and his length instead of using it. I think Tim exhibits a better jab, thus better range control 
than somebody like Sebastian. Yeah. And because he's got a better jab, he sets up his shots better, yeah. controls the distance better. The holes that were there to be exploited in Sebastian, they will not be there with Tim. Tim makes it past this guy. He may be looking at a Jermel Charlo fight next year, maybe even a Crawford fight. As Terrence Crawford, he's gunning for a Canelo fight, but it's looking more and more like he's barking up the wrong tree. So maybe instead of going from 147 up to 168, he can go from 147 up to 154. Fight Tim for the WBO. Could always fight Jermel Charlo for the three belts he still got while he's up there. He could. As far as Jermel, the track south, track down from 168 back down to 154. You don't make a trek like that without it costing you something. Who he fights next and where he fights them will be of particular importance. Because if he decides he's going to fight either Tim Zhu or Terrence Crawford at 154, his first fight back, might stop him. They might knock him out. I reiterate, he hasn't made that weight in over a year. I don't know how long it's going to take him to come back, but the longer it takes, the harder it will be to make the wait. More it'll take out of him. It's in need of redemption, and I don't imagine he's in good spirits right now, given what's being said about him. He can't be riding high, even if he did make all that money. Stock is down. Those things in mind, Pauli Malinaji is not off base. If Jermel Charlo's next fight is Tim Zhu, provided Tim beats Brian, Tim might knock him out. $20 million later, how hungry do you expect the guy to be? It's a valid point. In other news, more movement in the men's cruiserweight division per the social media account of up-and-comer Ryan Rositsky of Canada. No easy road to the WBC world title, but Jack wouldn't want it any other way. Jack Dempsey, an idol of young Ryan Rositsky. And a fighter he likens himself to. I see the resemblance. After just having a 10-round war for the North American title, I will be back in the ring only eight weeks later to face one of the hardest punchers in boxing. 39 knockouts and 42 wins. Durudola. The fight will be a final eliminator for the title. One more man to kill before I get my chance at the champion of the cruiserweight division as it pertains to the World Boxing Council's cruiserweight title. The story, Star. when last we heard it, was that Badu Jack, reigning WBC cruiserweight champion, had vacated the title to move up the bridgerweight to take on Lukasz Rosensky of Poland. Uh. And a newly vacated title, when last we heard, was supposed to be contested between the former champion, Lunga Makabu, and Noel Gavor, otherwise known as Noel Michaela. Neither of those two fights have been officially announced. Badu Jack versus Lukasz Rosensky or Makabu versus McKaylin. But that's the story when last we heard it. So if Ryan Rositsky takes care of business in December, and that news, if it checks out, he'll be looking at the winner of Makabu versus Gavor. Ryan Rositsky, who sports a professional record of 19 wins with one loss, no draws, 18 knockouts. This kid can punch. He's a strong puncher. Having never been knocked out in 20 professional bouts, which is saying a lot because he was in there with Oscar Rivas, former Olympian and a bona fide heavyweight. A strong puncher, Ryan Rositsky gave Oscar Rivas all he could handle in what was the inaugural Bridgerweight title fight. He has oh. since moved back down, down to cruiserweight. He's going to be taking on Durudola. Sports a pro record of 42 wins with nine losses, no draws, 39 knockouts, having been knocked out seven times in 51 professional bouts and he's getting long in the tooth this guy's in his early 40s so he is a strong puncher he does have power and you know the old saying goes power when it comes to power in the sport of boxing power is the last thing to go and he's still got it he's been busy he fought three times three times last year racked up some more knockouts fought three more times three more times this year last in action in july against isaac ankara stop that guy in two rounds few limitations aside durudola is still a strong puncher one of the stronger punchers at this weight i think the same can be said for Ryan Rositsky, who is many years younger than Durudola. Ryan is 14 years younger. He's 28 years old to Durudola, who's 42. Having last seen action not but a week or so ago against Alante Green, racking up a 10th round knockout off a monster left hook. And he's been just as busy, just as prolific as Durudola, having fought three times last year and three times this year. Just like Durudola, this guy's not asleep at the wheel. He ain't missing a beat. And they're both bangers. They're both 
knockout punchers, mid-range to inside fighters. So it's almost a guarantee that somebody's going to the hospital. Somebody is getting knocked out. I feel like Ryan Rositsky is approximately maybe one or two fights from the big time. Two fights, two fights approximately because he's got to get in position to fight for the title. Then he's got to win it. Once he wins it, he's on the world stage with Jai Opataya, with Arsene Goulamari and Chris Billum Smith. If the rumors and rumblings of Makabu versus Gavor for the newly vacated WBC title, if those rumors check out, then the winner of that fight is who Ryan would be fighting sometime next year. And if he can win that fight, He's on the world stage with the other three champions at this weight and in line for the big bucks, the big paydays. His weight is heating up again. It's been a while. Ever since Oleksandr Yusik moved up in weight, the attention this division has been getting has lowered, lowered as of late. But with Zerto Ramirez's ascent to the cruiserweight division this past weekend's contest with Joe Smith Jr., Jai Opataya's highlight reel knockout over the massive Jordan Thompson. Things are heating up. Two belts on the Sky Sports and Boxer side of things. The WBO title that Chris Billum Smith holds and reportedly they signed Arsene Goulamari, a WBA champion. Ryan Rositsky could be competitive with a lot of these fighters. He could be competitive with Zerto. He might actually knock out Zerto. He could definitely be competitive with Chris Billum Smith and Arsene Goulamarian. He's a banger. He's got his flaws, but so do they. Everybody's got areas where they could be better. His biggest competition is Jai Opataya, the number one ranked cruiserweight in the world, but that's not saying much because he's everybody's biggest competition at this weight. Ryan Rositsky included. Mid-range to inside pressure fighter, a brawler, a mauler, a fighter who likens himself to the late, great Jack Dempsey, and I see the resemblance. I see why. Decent chance of knocking out Durudola, who's been knocked out seven times already, and he's not getting any younger. He's 42 years old. He just has to mind his power. Deliver his own. If he can do that, he gets his crack at the apple. He'll get his chance to fight for the WBC title. Look for Rositsky versus Durudola in early December, and we'll talk more about the fight as the fight date approaches.